My code alone from its simplicity has been more beneficial to France than the whole mass of laws which preceded it. My schools and my system of mutual instruction are preparing generations yet unknown. Thus, during my reign, crimes were rapidly diminishing, while on the contrary, with our neighbors in England, they have been increasing to a frightful degree. This alone is sufficient to enable anyone to form a decisive judgment of the respect of governments. Look at the United States, where, without any apparent force or effort, everything goes on prosperously, everyone is happy and contented, and this is because the public wishes and interests are, in fact, the ruling power, place the same government at variance with the will and interests of its inhabitants, and you would soon see what disturbance, trouble, and confusion, and above all, what an increase of crimes would ensue. When I acquired the supreme direction of affairs, it was wished that I might become a Washington. Words cost nothing. And no doubt, those who were so ready to express the wish did so without any knowledge of times, places, persons, or things. Had I been in America, I would willingly have become a Washington, and I should have had little merit in so being, for I do not see how I could reasonably have acted otherwise, but had Washington been in France, exposed to discord within and invasion from without, I would have defied him to have been what he was in America, at least he would have been a fool to attempt it and would only have prolonged the existence of evil. For my own part, I could only have been crowned Washington. It was only in a Congress of Kings, in the midst of Kings, yielding or subdued that I could become so. Then in there alone could I successfully display Washington's moderation, disinterestedness, and wisdom. I could not reasonably attain to this, but by means of the universal dictatorship. To this I aspired. Can that be thought a crime? Can it be believed that to resign this authority would have been beyond the power of human nature? Scylla, glutted with crimes, dared to abdicate, pursued by public execution. What motive could have checked me, who would have been followed by only blessings? But it remained for me to conquer Moscow. How many will hereafter regret my disasters and my fall? But... To require prematurely of me that sacrifice for which the time had not arrived was a vulgar absurdity, and for me to have proclaimed or promised it would have been taken for hypocrisy or quackery. That was not my way. I repeat, it remained for me to conquer at Moscow. On another occasion, pausing before Toby, he said, what after all is this poor human machine? There is not one whose exterior form is like another or whose internal organization resembles the rest. And it is by disregarding this truth that we are led to the commission of so many errors. Had Toby been a Brutus, he would have put himself to death. If an Aesop, he would now perhaps have been the governor's advisor. If an ardent and zealous Christian, he would have been born his chains in the sight of God and blessed them. As for Toby, he endures his misfortunes very quietly. He stoops to his work and spends his days in innocent tranquility. Then after looking at him for a few moments in silence, he turned away and said, certainly it is a great step from poor Toby to a King Richard. And yet continued he as he walked along. The crime is not the less atrocious for this man, after all, had his family, his happiness, and his liberty. And it was a horrible act of cruelty to bring him here to languish in the fetters of slavery. Then suddenly, stopping short, he added, but I read in your eyes that you think he is not the only example of the sort in St. Helena. And whether he felt offended at being placed on a parallel with Toby, whether he thought it necessary to raise my spirits or whatever else might be his reason, he went on with dignity and animation. My dearest Casas, there is not the least resemblance here. If the outrage is of a higher class, the victims also possess very different resources. We have not been exposed to corporeal suffering. Or if that had been attempted, we have souls to disappoint our tyrants. Our situation may even have its charms. The eyes of the universe are fixed upon us. We are martyrs of an immortal cause. Millions of human beings are weeping for us. Our country sighs and glory mourns our fate. We here struggle against the oppression of the gods. And the prayers of nations are for us. 
After a pause of a few seconds, he continued, Besides, this is not the source of my real sufferings. If I considered only myself, perhaps I should have reason to rejoice. Misfortunes are not without their heroism and their glory. Adversity was wanting to my career. Had I died on the throne, enveloped in the dense atmosphere of my power, I should to many have remained a problem. But now misfortune will enable all to judge of me without disguise. December 1st through 3rd. Many incidents fill up this interval. Some I reject is unnecessary. Some it is proper. I should withhold. I hear no doubt. Only a few anecdotes of the general in chief of the army of Italy. After the passage of the Mincio, Napoleon having concerted all his plans and pursued the enemy in every direction, entered a castle on the left bank of the river. He was troubled with the headache. And he used a footpath. A large detachment of the enemy in great confusion arrived. Having ascended the river as far as the castle, Napoleon had only a few persons with him. The sentinel on duty at the gate had just time to close it, exclaiming, Two arms! And the general of the army of Italy in the hour of victory was compelled to escape through the back gate of the garden. But one with only one boot on. Had he been made prisoner before his reputation was established, the acts of genius which had marked the commencement of his career would perhaps by the common run of mankind have been considered merely as fortunate and blamable enterprises. The danger which the French general had just escaped, a circumstance which, through his method of operations, was likely often to recur, was the origin of the guides appointed to guard his person. These guides have since been introduced in other arts. Armies. In the same campaign, Napoleon incurred another imminent risk. Wormser, who had been compelled to throw himself into Mantua and who was debouching suddenly on an open plain, learned from an old woman that only a few moments before his arrival, the French general, with but a few followers, had stopped at her door and that he had fled within sight of the Austrians. Wormser immediately dispatched parties of cavalry in every direction calculating with certainty on the precious capture. But, said the emperor, I must do him justice. He gave particular orders that I should not be killed or harmed in any way. Fortunately for the young general, his happy star and the swiftness of his horse preserved him. The new system of military operations practiced by Napoleon disconcerted everyone. The campaign was scarcely open when Lombardy was inundated with troops in every direction, and the French approached to Mantua pell-mell with the enemy. The general-in-chief, when in the neighborhood of Pizzicatoni, met a great fat German captain or colonel who had been made prisoner. Napoleon took a fancy to question him without being known and inquired how affairs were going on. Very badly, replied the officer. I know not how it will end, but no one seems to understand what is doing. We have been sent to fight a young blackhead who attacks you on the right and on the left, in front and in the rear, so that there is no knowing how to proceed. This mode of carrying on war is intolerable, and for my part, I am very glad to have done with it. Napoleon used to relate that after one of his great actions in Italy, he passed over the field of battle with two or three other persons before the dead bodies had been interred in the deep silence of a beautiful moonlit night. Said the emperor, a dog leaping sadly from beneath the clothes of his dead master rushed upon us and then immediately returned to his hiding place. Howling piteously, he alternately licked his master's face and again flew at us. Thus at once soliciting aid and seeking revenge, whether owing to my own particular turn of mind at the moment, continued the emperor, the time, the place, or the action itself, I know not. But certainly no incident on any field of battle ever produced so deep an impression on me. I involuntarily stopped to contemplate the scene this man thought i perhaps has friends in the camp or in his company and here lies forsaken by all except his dog what a lesson nature here presents through the medium of an animal what a strange being is man and how mysterious are his impressions i had without emotions ordered battles which were to decide the fate of the army. I had beheld with tearless eyes the execution of those operations by which numbers of my countrymen were sacrificed, and here my feelings were aroused by the mournful howling of a dog. Certainly at that moment, I should have been easily moved by a suppliant enemy. I could very well imagine Achilles surrendering up the body of Hector at the sight of Priam's tears. 
the fourth through fifth. My eyes had become so bad that I was obliged to suspend my occupation. I had nearly lost my sight on the campaign of Italy. For some time past, a sensible change had taken place in the weather. We knew nothing about the order of the seasons, as the sun passed twice over our heads in the course of the last year. We say we ought at least to have two summers. Everything was totally different from what we had been accustomed to, and to complete our embarrassments, we were obliged, being now in the southern hemisphere, to make all our calculations in a manner quite the reverse of that which we had practiced in Europe. It rained frequently, the air was very damp, and it grew colder than before. The emperor could no longer go out in the evening. He was continually catching cold and did not sleep well. He was obliged to give up taking his meals beneath the tent. And he had them served up in his own chamber. Here he found himself better, but he could not stir from his seat. Our conversation continued after the dinner was removed from table. Today the emperor attacked General Gorgow on the elements and first exercises of artillery. The general had recently belonged to that department of the service, and all his professional science was quite fresh. The discussion was very curious and was maintained with great spirit. Napoleon never proved himself to be the weaker party. One might have been tempted to believe that he had just passed his examination at the academy. The conversation then turned on war and great commanders. The fate of a battle, observed the emperor, is the result of a moment, of a thought. The hostile forces advance with various combinations. They attack each other and fight. For a certain time, the critical moment arrives. A mental flash decides, and the least reserve accomplishes the object. He spoke of Lutz and Bouts and ETC, and afterwards, alluding to Waterloo, he said that he had followed up the idea of turning the enemy's right. He should easily have succeeded. He, however, preferred piercing the center and separating the two armies, but all was fatal in that engagement. It even assumed the appearance of absurdity. Yet, nevertheless, he ought to have gained the victory. He never had any of his battles presented less doubt to his mind, nor could he now account for what had happened. Grouchy, he said himself, had lost himself. They appeared bewildered, and his countenance at once expressed the remorse he felt for the transactions of Fontainebleau and of Lonely Saunier. Derlon was useless. In short, the generals were no longer themselves. If in the evening he had been aware of Grouchy's position and could have thrown himself upon it, he might, in the morning, with the help of that fine reserve, have repaired his ill success and perhaps even have destroyed the Allied forces by one of those miracles, those turns of fortune, which were familiar to him and which would have surprised no one. But he knew nothing of Grouchy. And besides, it was not easy to act with decision among the wrecks of the army. It would be difficult to imagine the conditions of the French army on that disastrous night. It was a torrent dislodged from its bed, sweeping away everything in its course. Turning to another subject... He said that the dangers incurred by the military commanders of antiquity were not to be compared to those which attended the generals of modern times. There was, he observed, no position in which a general might not now be reached by artillery. But anciently, a general ran no risk except when he himself charged which Caesar did only twice or thrice. We rarely said he find combined together all the qualities necessary to constitute a great general. The object most desirable is that a man's judgment should be in equilibrium with his personal courage that raises him at once above the common level. This is what the emperor termed being well squared, both by the base and perpendicular. If, continued he, courage be a general's predominating quality, he will be rashly embarked in enterprises above his conceptions. And on the other hand, he will not venture to carry his ideas into effect if his character or courage be inferior to his judgment. He then cited the example of the viceroy, whose sole merit consisted in this equilibrium of character, which however sufficed to render him a very distinguished man, Physical and moral courage then became the subject of discourse. With respect to physical courage, the emperor said, it was impossible for Murat and Ney not to be brave, but no man ever possessed less judgment, the former in particular. As to moral courage, observed he, I have very rarely met with the two o'clock in the morning courage. I mean, 
unprepared courage, that which is necessary on an unexpected occasion and which in spite of the most unforeseen events leaves full freedom of judgment and decision, he did not hesitate to declare that he was himself evidently gifted with his two o'clock in the morning courage and that in this respect he had met with but few persons who were at all equal to him. He remarked that an incorrect idea was generally formed of the strength of my necessary to engage in one of those great battles on which depends the fate of an army or nation or the possession of a throne. Generals added he are rarely found eager to give battle. They choose their positions, establish themselves, consider their combinations, but then commences their indecision. Nothing is so difficult and at the same time so important as to know when to decide. He next proceeded to notice several generals and condescended to reply to some questions that were asked of him. Clibert said he was endowed with the highest talent, but he was merely the man of the moment. He pursued glory as the only road to enjoyment, but he had no national sentiment and he could without any sacrifice, have devoted himself to foreign service. Clavier had commenced his youthful career among the Prussians, to whom he continued much attached, to say possessed, in a very superior degree, the important equilibrium above described. Moreau scarcely deserved to be placed in the first rank of generals. In him, nature had left her work unfinished. He possessed more instinct than genius in land. Courage at first predominated over judgment, but the latter was every day gaining ground and approaching equilibrium he had become a very able commander at the period of his death i found him a dwarf said the emperor but i lost him a giant and another general whom he named judgment was on the contrary superior to courage it could not be denied that he was a brave man but he like many others did not forget the chance of the cannonball speaking of military ardor and courage the emperor said i know the depth through what i call the drought of water of all my generals some added he joining action to his words will sink to the waist some to the chin other over the head but the number of the latter is very small i assure you Suchet, he said was one whose courage and judgment had been surprisingly improved messina was a very superior man and by a strange peculiarity of temperament he possessed the desired equilibrium only in the heat of battle it was created in the midst of danger. The generals finally observed the emperor who seemed destined to rise to future distinction where Gerard Clausel Foy Lamarck ETC. These are my new marshals. The sixth. The emperor, after dictating to me this morning, was successfully engaged with the other gentlemen with whom he prolonged his walk for some time. When they withdrew, I followed him into the lower path. He was dull and silent, and his countenance appeared somewhat harsh and ruffled. Well, said he, as we were returning to dinner, we shall have sentinels under our windows at Longwood. They wish to force me to have a foreign officer at my table and in my drawing room. I cannot mount my horse without being accompanied by an officer. In short, we cannot stir a step under pain of being insulted. I replied that this was another drop of sorrow added to the bitter cup which we were doomed to drink to his past glory and power, but that his philosophy was sufficient to defy the malice of his enemies and to make them blush for their brutality in the face of the whole world. I ventured to remark that the Spanish princes of Valencay and the Pope at Fontainebleau had never experienced such treatment. Certainly not, resumed he. The princes haunted and gave balls at Valencay without being physically aware of their chains. They experienced Experienced respect and courtesy at all hands. Old King Charles IV removed from Compiègne to Marseille and from Marseille to Rome whenever he wished. And yet how different are those places from this? The Pope at Fontainebleau, whatever may have been the report circulated in the world, was treated in the same manner. And yet how many persons, in spite of all the indulgences he enjoyed, refused to be appointed to guard him? A circumstance which gave me no offense, for I thought it perfectly natural. Such employments are subject to the influence of delicacy of feeling, and our European manners require that power should be limited by honor he observed that for his own part as a private man and an officer he should without hesitation have refused to guard the pope whose removal to france he added had never been ordered by him i manifested great surprise you are astonished said he 
You do not know this, but it is nevertheless true, as well as many other similar facts, which you will learn in course of time. But with reference to the subject on which we have just been speaking, it is necessary to distinguish the conduct of the sovereign who acts collectively from that of the private man whose sentiments are without constraint. Policy permits may frequently demands from the one what would be unpardonable in the other the hour at the hour of dinner by introducing various subjects of conversation diverted his melancholy and his cheerfulness finally prevailed meanwhile the emperor seriously determined to quit his present wretched abode whatever convenience his new residence might present on going to pass the remainder of the evening with our host the emperor directed me to present him a box bearing his cipher and to tell him he was sorry for all the trouble he had occasioned to him. The seventh, the emperor summoned me to attend him at an early hour. He began to read the Nouvelle Eloise, frequently remarking on the ingenuity and force of the arguments, the elegance of the style and expression. He read for upwards of two hours. This reading made a powerful impression on me. It produced a deep melancholy, a mingled feeling of tenderness and sorrow. I had always been fond of the work, and it now awakened happy recollections and excited deep regret. The emperor frequently smiled at me during breakfast. The Nouvelle Eloise was a topic of conversation. Jean Jacques has overcharged his subject, said the emperor. He has painted madness. Love should be a source of pleasure, not of misery. I allege that Jean Jacques had described nothing which a man might not feel, and that even the misery to which the emperor alluded was in reality happiness. I see, said you, said he. You have a little touch of the romantic. Has love's misery rendered you happy? I do not complain of my fate, sire, replied I. Were I to begin life again, I should wish to retrace the course I have already pursued. The emperor resumed his reading after breakfast. But he paused occasionally. The enchantment seemed to seize him in his turn. He at length laid down the book, and we went out to the garden. Really, said he, as we walked along, this work is not without fire. It moves. It rouses the feelings. He discussed the subject deeply. We were very prolix in our remarks, and we at length agreed that perfect love is like ideal happiness, that both are equally airy, fugitive, mysterious, and inexplicable, and that finally love is the business of the idle man, the recreation of the warrior, and the ruin of the sovereign. We were joined by the Grand Marshal and Mr. Gorgow, who had just come from long when the Admiral had for some days past been urgent for our removal thither, and the Emperor was no less anxious to go, the accommodation at Briar being so bad. However, before he removed, it was necessary that the smell of the paint should be entirely gone, for owing to his peculiar organization, he could not possibly endure it. In the imperial palace, his care had to be taken never to expose him to it. In his different charities, the slightest smell of paint frequently rendered it necessary to change the apartments that had been prepared for him, and on board of the Northumberland, the paint of the ship had made him very ill. He had been informed on the preceding evening that all was ready at Longwood and that the disagreeable effect of the paint was entirely gone. He accordingly determined to move on the Saturday following as he would thus be rid of the annoyance of the workmen on Sunday. But the Grand Marshal and Mr. Gorgow now came to say that they had visited the place and that it was not habitable. The Emperor expressed much vexation at the first account he had received on the resolution it had led him to adopt the two gentlemen withdrew and we entered the lower walk the emperor was much out of humor mr de montalon now arrived very mal a propos from longwood declaring that all was ready and that the emperor might remove as soon as he wished these two accounts, so contradictory and so close upon each other, strongly excited his displeasure. Fortunately, dinner was announced, which diverted his attention from the subject. The cloth was laid in the emperor's chamber, for he had so severe a cold that he could not endure the tent. After dinner, he resumed his reading and ended the day as he had begun it with the Nouvelle Eloise. 
the eighth through ninth. Owing to the doubt which had yesterday arisen respecting the paint, I determined to go myself to ascertain the real state of the case and to acquaint the emperor with it at breakfast time. I accordingly set out very early, walking three parts of the way, because nobody was up who could prepare a horse for me. I returned before nine o'clock. The smell of the paint was certainly very slight, but it was too much for the emperor. On the ninth, the captain of the Minden 74 gun ship was introduced to the Emperor in the garden. The captain had arrived from the Cape of Good Hope and was on the eve of sailing for Europe. He had had the honor of being presented to Napoleon Paris under the consulate about 12 years before. He requested permission to introduce one of his lieutenants to the Emperor on account of some personal circumstances which we thought very singular. The young man was born in Bologna. Precisely at the period when the French army entered that city, the French general, Napoleon, had by some accident been present at the christening of the child to whom he gave a tricolored cockade, which has since been carefully preserved in the family. After the departure of these gentlemen, the Grand Marshal arrived from Longwood. He thought the paint was by no means offensive. The emperor's present accommodation was very bad, and a portion of his property had already been removed. He therefore resolved to proceed to Longwood on the day following, of which I was heartily glad I had for some time past had an opportunity of observing that a determination had been adopted to compel the emperor to quit his present abode. I had kept to myself... All the communications, public or private, that had been made to me on the subject, I made it a rule to spare him every cause of vexation that I possibly could, and merely contented myself with acting in the way I thought was most advisable. Two days before, an officer was sent to carry away the tent, though we had expressed no wish to that effect. The officer had also been directed to remove the outside shutters from the emperor's windows, but this I opposed, telling him it could not be done, as the emperor had not yet risen, and I sent him away. On another occasion, with the view of alarming me, I was told as a great secret that if the emperor did not immediately remove, it was intended to station a hundred soldiers at the gates of the enclosure. Very well, I replied, and took no further notice. What could be the occasion of all this hurry? I suspect that the caprice of our jailers and the desire of pushing their authority to the utmost had more concern in the business than anything else. We received newspapers down to the 15th of September, and they became the subject of conversation. The emperor analyzed them. The future appeared enveloped in clouds. However, said the emperor, three great events present themselves to the imagination, the division of France, the reign of the Bourbons, or the new dynasty. Louis the Eighteenth observed he might easily have reigned in 1814 by rendering himself a national monarch. Now he has only the odious and uncertain chance arising out of excessive severity, a reign of terror. His dynasty may be permanently established, or that which is to succeed him may still be in the secret of futurity. Someone might present observed that the duke of orleans might be called to the throne but the emperor by a string of very forcible and eloquent reasoning proved that unless the duke of orleans came to wear the crown in his turn by the natural order of succession it was well understood interest of all the sovereigns of europe to prefer him napoleon to the duke of orleans coming to the throne by a crime for said he what is the doctrine of kings against the events of the present day is it to prevent a renewal of the example which I furnished against what they call legitimacy? Now the example which I have set cannot be renewed above once in the course of many ages, but that of the Duke of Orleans, the near relative of the monarch on the throne, may be renewed daily, hourly, and in every country. There is no sovereign who is not in his own palace and about his own person, cousins, nephews, brothers, and other relations who can easily follow such an example." if it were once given. We read in the same papers an abstract of the memorial in justification of Marshal Ney. The emperor thought it most pitiable. It was not calculated to save his life and by no means to maintain his honor. The arguments in his defense were to say the least of them feeble and destitute of point. After all he had done, he still protested his devotedness to the king and his aversion of the emperor. An absurd plan, said Napoleon. 
but one which has been generally adopted by those who have figured in the present memorable times and who seem not to have considered that I am so entirely identified with our prodigies, our monuments, our institutions, and all of our national acts that to separate me from them is to wrong France. The glory of France is to acknowledge me. And in spite of all the subtlety, evasion, and falsehood that may be employed to prove to the contrary, my character will still be fairly estimated by the French nation. Ney's defense continued. He was plainly traced out. He was led on by a general impulse, which he thought calculated to ensure the welfare of his country. He had obeyed without premeditation. And without any treasonable design, a change of fortune had ensued, and he was cited before a tribunal. This was all he had to say with respect to the great events that had taken place. As to the defense of his life, there was nothing to be said on that point, except, indeed, that he was protected by a solemn capitulation which guaranteed to every individual silence and oblivion with regard to all political acts and opinions. Had he pursued that line of defense... And were his life nevertheless to be sacrificed, it would be in the face of the whole world a violation of the most sacred laws. He would leave behind him the recollection of a glorious character carrying to the grave the sympathy of every generous mind and heaping disgrace and reprobation on his murderers. But this enthusiasm is probably beyond his moral strength, said the emperor. Nay, is the bravest of men and nothing more. It is certain that when Ney quitted Paris, he was wholly devoted to the king, and that he did not turn until he saw that all was lost. If he then proved himself enthusiastic in the opposite course, it was because he felt he had much to atone for. After his famous order of the day, he wrote to Napoleon that what he had done was principally with a view to the welfare of the country, and that as he could not henceforth be agreeable to the emperor, he begged that he would grant him permission to retire. The emperor desired him to come and said he would receive him, as he did on the day after the Battle of Moscow. Ney presented himself to Napoleon and said that after what had occurred at Fontainebleau, he must of necessity entertain doubts of his attachment and fidelity, and that therefore he solicited no other rank than that of a grenadier of the Imperial Guard. The emperor replied by stretching forth his hand to him and calling him the bravest of the brave, as he was accustomed to do. Nay, subsequently told the emperor. Blank, blank, blank. The emperor compared the situation of Ney to that of Turenne. Ney might be defended, but Turenne was unjustifiable, and yet Turenne was pardoned and loaded with honors, while Ney was probably doomed to die. In 1649, said he, Turenne commanded the royal army, which command had been conferred on him by Anne of Austria, the region of the kingdom, though he had taken the oath of fidelity, yet he bribed his troops, declared himself for the Fronde, and marched on Paris. But when he was declared guilty of high treason, his repentant army forsook him. Had Turenne took refuge with the Prince of Hesse to avoid the pursuit of justice, nay, on the contrary, was urged by the unanimous wish and outcry of his army. Only nine months had elapsed since he had acknowledged a monarch who had been preceded by 600,000 foreign bayonets, a monarch who had not accepted the constitution presented to him by the Senate as the formal and necessary condition of his return, and who, by declaring that he had reigned 19 years, proved that he regarded all preceding government as usurpations, nay, whose education had taught him to respect the national sovereignty, and fought for five and 20 years to support that cause, and from a private soldier had raised himself to the rank of marshal. If his conduct of the 20th of March was not honorable, it is at least explicable. And in some respects pardonable, but Turenne was absolutely criminal because the Fronde was the ally of Spain, which was then at war with his sovereign, and because he had been prompted by his own interest and that of his family in the hope of obtaining a sovereignty at the expense of France, and consequently to the prejudice of his country. The tenth, the emperor ordered me to be called about nine o'clock to accompany him into the garden. He was obliged to leave his chamber very early, as all the furniture was to be removed that morning to Longwood. On entering the garden, the emperor sent for Mr. Balcombe, our host. He then ordered his breakfast and invited Mr. Balcombe to breakfast with him. He was in charming spirits, and his conversation was very lively. About two o'clock, the admiral was announced. He advanced with an air of embarrassment the manner in which the emperor had been treated 
located at Briars and the restraints which had been imposed upon the members of his suite residing in the town had occasioned a coolness between them. The emperor had discontinued receiving the visits of the admiral yet on the present occasion he behaved to him as though they had met but yesterday at length we left briars and set out for longwood the emperor rode the horse which had been brought to him from the cape he had not seen him before he was a small sprightly and tolerably handsome animal the emperor wore his uniform and the chasseurs of the guard his graceful figure and handsome countenance were particularly remarkable his appearance attracted to general notice and i was gratified to hear the observations it called forth the admiral was very attentive to him many persons had collected on the road to see him pass several english officers together with ourselves formed his escort the road from briars to longwood runs for some distance in the direction of the town it then turns off suddenly to the right and after three or four windings clears the chain of hills forming one side of the valley the road next opens a level height of gentle acclivity and a new horizon and new scenes present themselves we now left behind us the chain of barren mountains and rocks which distinguish the landing side of the island and saw before us a transverse group of hills of which diana's peak is the highest and appears like the keystone or the nucleus of a surrounding scene on the left or eastern side where longwood is situated the horizon is bounded by the broken chain of rocks forming the outline and barrier of the island there the soil exhibits an uncultivated desert but on their right the eye rests on an extensive tract of country which though rugged at least presents traces of vegetation it is covered with numerous residences and upon the whole is tolerably well cultivated on this side it must be convinced confess the picture is romantic and pleasing here a deep valley opens on the left of the road which is in very good condition and two miles farther on where the road turns in an angular direction stands hut's gate a wretched little house which was selected as the residence of the grand marshal and his family at a short distance from this point the valley on the left having gradually increased in depth forms a circular gulf which from its vast depth and extent has received the name of Devil's Punch Bowl. The road is here contracted by an eminence on the right, and it runs along by the side of this precipice until it turns off in the direction of Longwood, which is close at hand. At the entrance of Longwood, we found a guard under arms who rendered the prescribed honor to the august captain, the emperor's captive the emperor's horse which was spirited and untractable being unused to this kind of parade was startled at the sound of the drum he refused to pass the gate and it was only by the help of a spur that his rider succeeded in forcing him to advance at this moment i observed very expressive looks exchanged among the persons composing the emperor's escort we entered our new residence about four o'clock the admiral took great pains to point out to us even the minutest details at logwood he had superintended all the arrangements and some things were even the work of his own hands. The emperor was satisfied with everything, and the admiral seemed highly pleased. He had evidently anticipated petulance and disdain, but the emperor manifested perfectly good humor. He retired at six o'clock and beckoned me to follow him to his chamber. Here he examined various articles of furniture and inquired whether I was similarly provided. On my replying in the negative, he insisted on my accepting of them, saying in the most engaging manner, Take them. I shall want for nothing. I shall be taken better care of than you. He felt much fatigued, and he asked whether he did not look so. This was a consequence of having passed five months in perfect inactivity. He had walked a good deal in the morning besides riding some miles on horseback. Our new residence was provided with a bathing machine, which the admiral had ordered the carpenters to fit up in the best way they could. The emperor, who since he quitted Malmaison, had been obliged to dispense with the use of the bath, which to him had become one of the necessaries of life, expressed a wish to bathe immediately and directed me to remain with him. The most trivial details of our new establishment came once 
more under consideration. And as the apartment which had been assigned to me was very bad, the emperor expressed a wish that during the day I should occupy what he called his topographic cabinet, which had joined his own private closet in order, as he said, that I might be near to him. I was much affected by the kind manner in which all this was spoken. He even went so far as to repeat to me several times that I must come next morning and take a bath in his machine. And when I excused myself on the grounds of the respect and the distance which it was indispensable should be observed betwixt us. My dear Las Casas, said he, fellow prisoners should accommodate each other. I do not want the bath all day, and it is no less necessary to you than to me. One would have supposed that he wished to indemnify me for the loss I was about to sustain in being no longer the only individual about his person. This kindness delighted me. It is true. And it also produced a feeling of regret. The kindness of the emperor was doubtless the reward of my assiduous attentions at Briars, but it also gave me cause to anticipate the close of that constant intercourse with him for which I had been indebted to our profound solitude. The emperor, not wishing to dress again, dined in his own chamber and desired me to remain with him. We were alone, and our conversation turned on a subject of a peculiar nature, the result of which may be exceedingly important. He asked my opinion and told me to communicate it to him next morning, the 11th through 14th. We now found unfolded to us a new portion of our existence on the wretched rock of St. Helena. We were settled in our new abode and the limits of our prison were marked out. Longwood, which was originally merely a farm belonging to the East India Company and which was afterwards given as a country residence to the deputy governor, is situated on one of the highest parts of the island. The difference of the temperature between this place and the valley where we landed is marked by a variation of at least 10 degrees of the English thermometer. Longwood stands on a level height, which is tolerably extensive on the eastern side and pretty near the coast. Continual and frequently violent gales, always blowing in the same quarter, sweep the surface of the ground. The sun, though it rarely appears, nevertheless exercises its influence on the atmosphere, which is apt to produce disorders of the liver. If due precaution be not observed, heavy and sudden falls of rain complete the impossibility of distinguishing any regular season. But there is no regular course of seasons at Longwood. The whole year presents a continuance of wind, clouds, and rain. And the temperature is of that mild and monotonous kind, which perhaps after all is rather conducive to ennui than disease. Notwithstanding the abundant rains, the grass rapidly disappears, being either nipped by the wind or withered by the heat. The water, which is conveyed hither by a conduit, is so unwholesome that the deputy governor, when he lived at Longwood, never suffered it to be used in his family until it had been boiled, and we are obliged to do the same. The trees, which at a distance impart a smiling aspect to the scene, are merely gum trees, a wretched kind of shrub affording no shade on one side. The horizon is bounded by the vast ocean, but the rest of the scene presents only a mass of huge barren rocks, deep gulfs, and desolate valleys, and in the distance appear the green and misty chain of mountains, above which towers Diana's Peak. In short, Longwood can be pleasing only to the traveler, after the fatigues of a long voyage, for whom the sight of any land is a cheering prospect. Arriving at St. Helena on a fine day he may perhaps be struck with singularity the objects which suddenly present themselves and may perhaps exclaim how beautiful but his visit is momentary and what pain does not his hasty admiration cause to the unhappy captives who are doomed to pass their lives in saint helena workmen had been constantly employed for two months in preparing longwood for our reception the result of their labors, however, amounted to little. The entrance to the house was through a room which had just been built and which was intended to answer the double purpose of an antechamber and a dining room. This apartment led to another, which was made the drawing room. Beyond this was a third room running in a cross direction and very dark. This was intended to be the depository of the emperor's maps and books, but it was afterwards converted into the dining room. The emperor's chamber opened into this apartment on the right-hand side. This chamber was divided into two equal parts, forming the emperor's cabinet and sleeping room. A little external gallery served for a bathing room opposite the emperor's chamber 
house at the other extremity of the building were the apartments of Madame de Montalon, her husband, and her son, which have since been used as the emperor's library. Detached from this part of the house was a little square room on the ground floor contiguous to the kitchen, which was assigned to me. My son was obliged to enter his room through a trap door. And by the help of a ladder, it was nothing but a loft and scarcely afforded room for his bed. Our windows and beds were without curtains. The few articles of furniture which were in our apartment had evidently been obtained from the inhabitants of the island, who doubtless readily seized the opportunity of disposing of them to advantage for the sake of supplying themselves with better. The Grand Marshal, with his wife and children, had been left at the distance of two miles behind us in a place which even here is denominated a hut, hut's gate. General Gorgow slept under a tent, as did also the doctor and the officer commanding our guard till such time as their apartments should be ready, which the crew of the Northumberland were rapidly preparing. We were surrounded by a kind of garden, but owing to the little attention which we had it in our power to bestow on its cultivation, joined to the want of water and the nature of the climate, it was a garden only by name. In front, a separated and separated from us by a tolerably deep ravine, was a camp, the 53rd Regiment. Different parties of which were posted on the neighboring heights. Such was our new abode. On the 12th, I communicated it to the Emperor, my opinion on the subject respecting which we had conversed two days before he came to no decision, conceiving the air fair to be useless. I ventured to maintain that, even doubtful as the case might be, there was nothing either to lose or to risk, and that it was merely taking a chance in the lottery without the expense of a share. Time, however, has proved that the Emperor judged correctly that the thing would have been perfectly useless. He could have led to no result. The same day, Colonel Wilkes, formerly governor of the East India Company, who had been succeeded by the Admiral, came to visit the Emperor. I acted as interpreter on the occasion. On the 13th or 14th, the Minden sailed for Europe, and I availed myself of the opportunity thus afforded to send letters to London and Paris. The 15th through the 16th, the domestic establishment of the Emperor on his departure from Plymouth consisted of Twelve persons. I feel pleasure in recording their names here. It is a testimony due to their devotedness. However numerous this establishment may appear, it may truly be said that after our departure from England during the voyage and from the time of our landing at St. Helena, it had ceased to be serviceable to the emperor. Our dispersion, the uncertainty of our establishment, our wants, and the ir irregular way in which they were supplied necessarily created disorder. As soon as we were all assembled, at Longwood, the emperor determined to arrange his establishment and to assign each of us an employment suited to our respective capacities, reserving to the Grand Marshal the general control and superintendence of the whole household. He consigned to Mr. de Montalon all the domestic details. To Mr. Gorkow, he entrusted the direction of the stables, and I was appointed to take care of the property and furniture and to superintend the management of our supplies. The latter part of my duty appeared to interfere too much with the regulation of domestic details. I conceived it would be conducive to the general advantage that these two departments should be under the control of one individual and I soon succeeded in accomplishing this object. Everything now proceeded tolerably well and we were certainly more comfortable than before but however reasonable might be the regulations made by the emperor they nevertheless sowed the seeds of discontent which took root and occasionally developed themselves one thought himself a loser by the change and another sought to attach too high an importance to his office and a third conceived that he had been wronged in the general division of duties we were no longer the members of one family each exerting his best endeavors to secure the advantage of the whole we were far from putting it to practice that which necessity seemed to dictate to us and a wreck of luxury or a remnant of ambition frequently became an object of dispute though attached to the person the emperor had united us around him yet chance and not sympathy had brought us together our connection was purely fortuitous and not the result of any natural affinity thus at long when we were encircled round a center but without any cohesion with each other. How could it be otherwise? We were 
almost all strangers to one another. And unfortunately, our different conditions, ages, and characters were calculated to make us continue. So these circumstances, though in themselves trifling, had the vexatious effect of depriving us of our most agreeable resources. They banished that confidence, that interchange of sentiment, and that intimate union which are calculated to soothe even the most cruel misfortunes. But on the other hand, these very circumstances served to develop many excellent traits in the emperor's character. They were apparent in his endeavors to produce among us unity and conformity of sentiment, his constant care to remove every just cause of jealousy the voluntary abstraction by which he averted his attention from that which he wished not to observe, and finally the paternal expressions of displeasure of which we were occasionally the objects, and which, to the honor of all be it said, were avoided as cautiously and received as respectfully as though they had emanated from the throne of the Tuileries, who in the world could not pretend to know the emperor and his character of a private man better than myself? Who else was with him during two months of solitude in the desert of Briars? Who else accompanied him in his long walks by moonlight and enjoyed so many hours in his society? Who, like me, had the opportunity of choosing the moment, the place, and the subject of his conversation? Who, besides myself, heard him recall to mind the charms of his boyhood or describe the pleasures of his youth and the bitterness of his recent sorrow? I am convinced that I know his character thoroughly and that I can now explain many circumstances which at the time of their occurrence seem to many difficult to be understood. I can now very well comprehend that that which struck us so forcibly, and which particularly characterized him in the days of his power, namely, that no individual ever permanently incurred the displeasure of Napoleon, however marked might be his disgrace, however deep the gulf into which he was plunged, he might still confidently hope to be restored to favor. Those who had once enjoyed intimacy, whatever cause of offense they might give him, never totally forfeited his regard. The emperor is eminently gifted with two excellent qualities, a vast fund of justice and a disposition naturally prone to attachment. Amidst all his vexations and fits of anger, a sentiment of justice still predominates. He is sure to turn an attentive ear to good arguments and, if left to himself, candidly brings them forward whenever they occur to his mind. He never forgets services performed for him, nor habits he has contracted sooner or later. He invariably casts a thought on those who may have incurred his displeasure. He reflects on what they have suffered, considers their punishment as sufficient, recalls them. And when they are perhaps forgotten by the world, and they again enjoy his good graces to the astonishment of themselves, as well as of others, of this... There have been many instances. The emperor is sincere in his attachments without making a show of what he feels. When once he becomes used to a person, he cannot easily bear separation. He observes and condemns his faults, blames his own choice, expressing his displeasure in the most unreserved way. But still, there is nothing to fear. These are but so many new ties of regard. It will probably be a matter of surprise that I should sketch the emperor's character in so simple a style. All that is usually written about him is so far-fetched. It has been thought necessary to employ antithesis and brilliant coloring to seek for effect and to rack the imagination for high-flown phrases. For my own part, I merely describe what I see and express what I feel. This reflection... By the by, comes apropos, the emperor was today reading with me in the English papers a portrait of himself drawn by the Archbishop of Malines and worked up with innumerable witticisms, affected antithesis and contrast. He desired the Grand Marshal to transcribe it word for word. The following are the principal points. The mind of Napoleon, says the Abbe de Prat, in his embassy to Warsaw in 1812, was vast, but after the manner of the Orientals, and through a contradictory disposition, it descended, as it were, by the effect of its own weight, to details which might justly be called low. His first idea was always grand, and his second mean and petty. His mind was like a purse of munificence, and meanness held each a string. His genius, which was at once adapted to the stage of the world, and the Mantebox show, resembled a royal robe joined to a harlequin's jacket. He was the man of extremes, one who, having commanded the Alps to bow down, the Simplon to smooth its ruggedness, and the sea to advance or recede from its shores, ended by surrender 
surrendering himself to an English cruiser, endowed with wonderful and infinite shrewdness, glittering with wit, seizing or creating in every question new and unperceived relations, abounding in lively and picturesque images, animated and pointed expressions, the more forcible from the very correctness of his language, which always bore a sort of foreign impress, sophistical, subtle, and changeable. To excess, he adopted different rules of optics from those by which other men are guided. Added to this, the delirium of success, the habit of drinking from the enchanted cup, and intoxicating himself with the incense of the world. And you may be enabled to form an idea of the man who, uniting in his caprices, all that is lofty and mean in the human character, majestic in the splendor of sovereignty and peremptory in command with all that is ignoble and base even in his grandest achievements joining the treacherous ambush to the subversion of thrones presents altogether such a jupiter's skipping as never before figured on the scene of life. Certainly here is an abundance of wit and of the most studied kind. I pass over the indecorous and disgraceful fact that a reverent prelate, an archbishop overwhelmed with the bounty of a sovereign to whom during his prosperity he paid the most assiduous court and offered the most abject flattery should in the adversity of that sovereign indulge in language so trivial, grotesque, and insulting as that above quoted with without noticing the harlequin's coat at Jupiter's Skeepin, I shall merely dwell on the merit of the Abbe de Pres judgment when he says that the emperor's first idea is always grand and his second petty, that he is a man of extremes. One who, having commanded the Alps to bow down to Simplon to smooth its rugness and the sea to advance and recede from its shores, ended by surrendering himself to an English cruiser. The Abbe de Pres must have formed a faint idea of the sublimity, grandeur, and magnanimity of that noble step to withdraw himself from a people who were misled by faithless intriguers in order to remove every obstacle to their welfare, to sacrifice his own personal interest for the sake of averting the evils of a civil war without national results to disdain honorable and secure, but dependent asylums to prefer taking refuge among a people to whom he had for the space of 20 years been an inveterate foe to suppose their magnanimity equal to his own to honor their law so far as to believe they would protect him from the ostracism of Europe. Certainly such ideas and sentiments are not the reverse of sublime, noble, and great.